The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Coming up on the agenda. You've also got kids who aren't showing up at school or maybe try to get in the school building and can't. Uh, think about the very first time you expressed your worry or your anxiety or, or, or sadness or concern about uh, cyberbullying or friendships might have been at school. And if you don't have the right supports in that school setting, like a, a social worker or another mental health professional, then that early prevention and detection, it doesn't happen. In fact, it gets missed. And, the, and we know there's not enough school social workers to support our education system across Ontario. Then, I think our mindset is still very much stuck in the age of the Old Testament. So if we go back to the book of Genesis, uh, God supposedly created humans in his own image and gave us dominion over the natural world. So we still very much see this natural world as a stage on which humans, whether that's great men and women or classes, play out our roles. But actually, the more the more we know about the natural world, the more we realize that we're, we're it's not a stage, we're actually, you know, it's a system, it's an ecosystem. And if we want to live in that ecosystem successfully, then humans' role is actually pretty, pretty insubstantial. That's ahead on the agenda. Believe it or not, about 25% of students in all grades will avoid going to school at some point in their educational lives. That according to the nonprofit organization Anxiety Canada. And the pandemic, it seems, only made that worse. What's causing students to miss class, sometimes chronically, and what can parents and teachers do about it? Let's find out more from DP Sir, CEO of the Ontario Association of Social Workers. Nathan Kaur, President of the Ontario Teachers Federation. Cheryl Boswell, Executive Director of Youth Mental Health Canada. And Family Counselor, Alison Schaefer. And it's great to have everybody around our table for this discussion tonight. Cheryl, let's just make sure we all know what we're talking about here. School avoidance or chronic absenteeism, call it what you want, define it. What is it? That's a good question. Um, well, it's a complex mental health disability um, that uh, is very, uh, presents very individually. So each story of school phobia, avoidance and absence looks quite different. Um, it's interesting you called it a mental health issue as opposed to kids just screwing off and not wanting to go to school. Exactly. So it's not... And We're all issues form, impact lab. mental health and wellness. Mm. So, you know, whatever the causes are, the impact and how uh, it um, presents in young people is intense school-induced anxiety mm. that uh, interferes with a student's ability to access and manage an education. How much of it's going on right now? Um, well, I mean, this is, uh, you know, it, the rates are increasing. Um, you know, people are tracking attendance more because of COVID and virtual learning. Mm. So before the pandemic, this was an issue. In some schools, 20, 25% up to, I've, you know, worked with some schools, 80% of the student population is absent due to mental health. Challenges and, when, and disabilities. When you say absent, you have to be away for how long for that to constitute? For, yeah, the definition of chronic absence is two days a month. So total of about 18 days a year, a school year. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, chronic absence is a huge issue. Gotcha. Let's uh, look at a quote here. This is Maria Rogers, Canada Research Chair in Child and Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing from a Globe and Mail editorial. Sheldon, I'll ask you to bring this graphic up and I will read along for those listening on podcast. Chronic absenteeism, which is defined as, here we go, missing 10% or more of school days, about two days for each month, had already been extensively studied by education and psychology researchers prior to the pandemic. It has been linked with a multitude of adverse student outcomes from early to late childhood, poor academic achievement, lower emotional well-being, and early termination from high school. Importantly, high rates of absenteeism among students in the earliest grades can have a snowball effect throughout a child's schooling experience. Students who are chronically absent as early as kindergarten are far more likely to drop out of high school compared with children who are not routinely absent in the early grades. 
Nathan, pick up the story if you would. How has this worsened thanks to COVID-19? I, th I think the, one of the largest challenges is that why are the students absent? Uh, I, I can appreciate your perspective and, and uh, pointing to mental health, but um, there must be more reasons than that on the table, especially coming out of a, a pandemic where we still have illnesses happening within the schools and we still have um, uh, teachers that are looking into their classrooms and uh, the absences are occurring. And um, who has the, whose obligation is it to find out why and to do something about it? Well, we're gonna certainly explore that in our conversation here. Tell us what's at stake academically when you miss a lot of school. You're behind. Uh, you have to catch up, and uh, it, it creates anxiety for the the uh, the student, and the, and the teacher then has to try to um, uh, differentiate, change that that programming to accommodate those absences, and it, it creates stress for not just the student but the, the the system as a whole. And I'm sure the parents out there uh, are who are dealing with. Um, a child at home when they should be in school, it's hard for them as well. DP, can you speak to the mental health angle in this as well, as opposed to, because when we think of kids cutting class, we often think because they'd rather hang out at the mall mm -hmm. or they want to go smoking behind the school and just don't want to go to class. This is not that, what we're talking about here. Well, I think, you know, my colleagues have pointed to a couple of really important things. But a pandemic had a huge impact on students. Three things come to mind for me. The first is we've seen a rise in mental health issues being reported by children and youth, things like bullying, worried sleep, anxiety, depression, um, eating disorders, relationship troubles. Uh, secondly, learning gaps, right? We've talked about kids going to school and then being virtual and returning back and masking. That's been difficult. And if you're worried about falling behind with your grades or worried you're not matching up to your peers, you're going to be worried about your success and your future. And then thirdly, I think a lot about socialization, social development. Missing out on school meant you can develop peer networks, develop friendships, you can conflict resolve the same way. Those things contribute to absenteeism, which, as you pointed out, is is a sign of something bigger going on and we have an opportunity to think about that uh, with mental health supports right in the school. Let me pick up on, on not just what you miss in terms of academics and grades when you don't go to school but the social interaction skills you need to develop just by being there. What do you miss out when you miss school? We're social creatures, right? Our motivation is to go be social, and then learning is a byproduct of that. If you, We know that besides class size, one of the biggest impacts on education is whether or not you perceive that your teacher likes you. Your grades go up when you like your teacher, you like your classmates. And so we send our children off to these institutions that are basically the second social institution of their lives. If they can't find their connection, their purpose, meaningfulness, um, kind and caring attitudes where they can flourish, then they're going to shut down. And the truth is there is a culture issue happening at our schools right now. If you feel that they're not safe, if you don't, if you feel invisible, you're not seen, you're not understood, you're being you know, put through a meat grinder, you're not going to perform. And so I think just the same way that we're seeing that that in the workplace people are quietly quitting and not wanting to come back and you know go back into the workplace to work we're seeing students that have said you know i could like lie in bed and watch youtube i can get my work done in a couple of hours in the afternoon and hand it in um i don't really need to show up and put up with the excruciating social environment of our high schools right now. So I think there is a, a bigger problem that we have to look at, and these are kids trying to self-manage around it. You say the second so, uh, social institution, the first being? The family, their family. the family unit. Yeah, there yeah. we go, gotcha. Cheryl, let's get, and again, we're, we're talking about those who have, as your book there suggests, a phobia about going to school. We're not talking about people who are just being truant here. Why don't they want to go? It's a good question. Um, uh, Youth Mental Health Canada did the first sur survey on school phobia in Canada. There's not the research in Canada. There's not the legislation. There's not the needs-based educational accommodations or funding. There's not the national leadership um, in elementary and secondary for students with permanent disabilities or direct funding to families to, to support their students, their children with mental health disabilities. So, you know, when we look at all those, so in terms of the survey, what we found, which was shocking to me because it's quite opposite to what you see in international research is the average age for warning signs of school phobia, five years old. Mm -hmm. So early on, the school building represents so much 
to some students, whether it's performance anxiety, social anxiety, whatever it is. Um, and when I was in the Netherlands in October at an international conference on school attendance, it was echoed by a number of researchers. They're starting to identify five years old as the early warning signs. That's really important information for us. If we're gonna look at early intervention, preventative, proactive, practical strategies to supporting students. So, you know, because unsupported mental health disabilities increase and increase suicide risk factors. Hmm. So this is not just, you know, um, they're absent, what can we do? This is a moral imperative. This is, as an education system, um, education is a service. There's human rights, compliance, and obligations that are required. Um, and it's a social responsibility, taking care, uh, taking better care of each other. All right, before we get there, though, I, I still want to know where they are. They're not going to class. DP, where are they going? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's a, a lot happening. They're at home. Yeah. Um, you know, they're having trouble getting out of bed oh, sometimes. Minute, they're at home. But it, presumably they've got a parent or a guardian at home who's saying, or time to get up and get going. Or you've got a parent or a guardian that's trying to navigate a few things. Virtual work or going into work, returning to work. They've got other kids in the home. Um, you've also got kids who aren't showing up at school or maybe try to get in the school building and can't. Uh, think about the very first time you expressed your worry or your anxiety or, or, or sadness or a concern about uh, cyberbullying or friendships might have been at school. And if you don't have the right supports in that school setting, like a, a social worker or another mental health professional, then that early prevention and detection, it doesn't happen. In fact, it gets missed, and, the, and we know there's not enough school social workers to support our education system across Ontario. Nope. And, and it leads to a mental health crisis. So, you know, very emotionally dysregulated young people, isolating at home, losing their peer network, the support network from school, um, not right. able to function. Um, you know, parents having to give up jobs or decrease hours for work to stay at home with their children. I mean, it's a huge issue being told it's the parent's responsibility to force the kid into school mm. um, and no supports provided by the school to find a way well, to get me, back in. Let me pick up on that. Nathan, you're the Ontario Teachers Federation rep here today. So what, what does a teacher feel their obligation is when a student is perpetually absent, school phobic as it were. I think any good teacher is going to try their best to do as much as they can in that situation, but they're not trained social workers, they're not school psychologists. Uh, their, their, their job is to provide the curriculum, provide learning. Uh, you need to do, you need to create an incredible learning atmosphere to do that. Um, but there's so much more that is expected of our education system today that wasn't expected in the past. Uh, we are talking about turning to the education system to assist in this issue, um, but we're also pushing on a full inclusionary model within classrooms. And the teacher is expected not just to teach to the middle, but to uh, diversify their teaching all the way from one spectrum of a learner to another. No, I get you. But and, and they don't have time to be able to, they're gonna try their best. I, I get you, but uh, d does a teacher see it as his or her responsibility to, for example, phone the parents, find out why the kid's not there? That I, kind I, of thing. I think if there's no one else to do it, they're gonna try, they're, they're gonna attempt as much as they can to make that connection to follow up. Uh, but there's only so much you can do when uh, you have so many other obligations on the table. And, and I think what Nathan has to say, you know, I don't know if you're going to say the same thing, is the teacher can't do it alone. Yeah, it's a school-wide exactly. approach that's needed, and that's what I get at with this book, mm. um, Supporting Students with School Phobia for Families and Schools, that we need a it very a comprehensive, system. coordinated approach with you know, involvement from everyone, whether, you know, through starting with the education support team. Well, let me get some facts on the table the, on that. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Sheldon, middle of page three here. Let's get this graphic up because these are the supports for students in school, sort of. Most elementary schools report less than one full-time guidance or teacher counselor, while most secondary schools report one full-time guidance or teacher counselor. 
In terms of mental health supports, one in four schools reported no available psychologist. More than half of schools reported having a full-time social worker. Most reported an option to connect virtually to a psychologist or social worker. And more secondary schools have a regular youth or social worker than elementary schools. Uh, okay, so that's where it's at. Do you think that's adequate? That's astounding. So think about that. Where our kids are, our children are, our youth are, each and every single day. We have 20,000 social workers in Ontario. Of course, not all of them are in schools. We have you know, social workers across a number of settings. 4,800 Ontario schools and less than 1,000 school social workers. Mm -hmm. And if you're a school social worker, you might be having 5, 10, or 13 schools on your caseload uh, across a large geography, which means less visibility for students, uh, teachers, school administrators, boards who are working so hard to try to wrap around these students. And that means we're not there for that early prevention, the early detection, and connecting people back in the community. So we've been asking our government to step up, find one social worker per school mm -hmm. so that you have that support system and you can create that care and that well-being each Full and every time. day. Okay. Full time. How Absolutely. close are we to that? Uh, well, let's hope your listeners and our government are listening today, but we, we do have conversations. We've been asking for that budget to be uh, part of that uh, uh, regulation and, and part of the regulatory bodies each and every day. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, yes, we need more, 100% completely agree, but I also know that the last thing a student wants to do is be excused from class so that they can go have their therapy session down the hall and all their friends know it. Mm. You know, that, that a lot of what we're talking about from a mental health perspective is the preventative part of creating healthy relationships. What better place to have healthy relationships than with your peers in your classroom? It's like that is a healing environment if we do it right. So I think we need teacher training yeah. around how to build a classroom culture that is cohesive and bonding and healing instead of having to wait until there's a mental health breakdown and then we have to send them down the hall to account to a, a mental health professional. We, I think we need to be more preventative. That's yeah. I, follow I, up on that though with parents. If it, I, I'm sure we've got parents watching or listening right now for whom this is an issue and they are at their wits end and they don't know what to do. What do you recommend? In terms of getting their child engaged yeah. in school? So again, you're talking about complete school, uh, you know, um, uh, I, 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 I would say part of the spectrum that's more severe than what I see in my in my counseling practice. In my counseling practice, I see a lot of kids that have got disengaged from learning, and they have basically think that school is a bit of a joke. You know, we can make it up in in credit recovery. Um, you know, they're gonna. I don't have to hand in any of my things. They'll just take two papers and like they. Okay, that's not phobia. Not, that's truancy. It, it's it's a it's a poor attitude about what is happening in for academia for them, and we, they're disengaged learners. As is what I would call them, which I think is different than having an anxiety as, uh, as an underlying piece to that. So when we look at that, a lot of it is about empowering parents to be able to set limits and boundaries. It's like parents who don't have a hard time getting their kids to bed at night or taking their tech away or getting them to school. There's a big piece of this, which is about empowering parents to be able to say, your child needs more boundaries and guardrails for them to be successful and as frustrated as you are let's get those parents resourced so that they feel empowered enough to say I, I need to I need to step up the population that I work with and I agree it's not you know I'm, it's, my, it's my my sector in my private practice may be unique so this isn't going to apply to everybody but those parents need to step up but that's a They're different that that's looks a, different that's, yes yeah. I think it's a different that's different I think it's from a, this yeah yeah that school. looks different than stressors like mm -hmm. instable, unstable housing, right. uh, food insecurity. I can't uh, deal with the racism or the cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. That looks really different, and we know that's directly linked to absenteeism, which is a little different than you know disengaged uh, students. Abs absolutely. absolutely. The and commonality a exists. The commonality exists that when a student is absent, someone needs to find out why. Mm -hmm. Who? And who is going to do that? Yeah. And you know what? The teacher is there. They have that connection. They have that. A relationship they're the they're the point person often in that especially in the elementary school system where the uh, they're the classroom teacher in high school it's a little different you know there's that division within the the different subjects and 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 you kind of turn to well who is going to make that phone call home um, but then it comes down to time it comes down to uh, the amount of students in a classroom the uh, the uh, the amount of um, time available outside of the classroom, because you're not making the call on your, your, your lunch break while you're making photocopies no, and you. running around. I get you, but I, but I, I mean, there, presumably there is a list of potential options here. 
either the principal's going to do it, or the guidance counselor's going to do it, or the teacher's going to do it, or... Or I mean, the social some, worker. Or the social right, worker. Right. Somebody in that setting has to be responsible for looking into this. Who is that person? And I would suggest if the expectation is that it's the teacher, you have to give them the time to do so. Right. But if the ding, expectation ding, ding. that there's a social worker there, and, and you have that ability well, and you have that people... Well, imagine a social worker and a teacher working together to, uh, to get to the bottom of it. Who's trained, because right. you're going to you're going to maybe encounter some significant major issues at a home that how can we all be specialized in as, as an educator, as a teacher, a great point, where David. there may be some individuals that do have that expertise all the way from how to address them to make a welcoming environment to dealing with significant mental health issues. Yeah, and I think it's not a choice you know, not to do. So, uh, you know, if you create an education support team, you have everyone working together, including the family, a critical component of this. The assessment forms, step by step, are in this guidebook. And then the action plans, you need an education support plan, you need a reentry plan, and all students need a mental wellness action plan. So when they're struggling, they know what to do. Okay, hang so, on, I, I need to know more about that. Every student in a... I believe... Two million students in the province, they all need a mental health action plan. Mental wellness mental action wellness. plan. What does that look like? Good question. So often what happens in the clinical setting is, a, you know, a, a young person or an adult is in crisis and they might make a safety contract. And it has, there's different terminology, but it's often called a safety contract. And often doesn't work because someone in a crisis is uh, dysregulated. So they're not at their best, they're struggling and whatever. So um, the best for me, for all young people, is create a mental wellness action plan. So you look at, it's sort of developing self and emotional awareness. Mm -hmm. You are aware of your stressors, your triggers, your resources in the community, resources in the school, uh, making those kinds of uh, resources transparent. So there's more awareness of, oh, you know, these, a social worker is available, a psychologist in the school, child and youth care worker, this is what they do in the community, who can I go to? And who makes that plan? Young people. They make it with And they can on update it. Um, there's also apps that you can use. There's um, a brother and sister from the United States, the Not OK app, free. You put in five trusted uh, contacts in it. Um, also identifying trusted adults in your school community. And I hmm. think what you were mentioning earlier is what we need to do is build mental wellness protective factors in mm -hmm. schools. So increasing suicide risk factors, we've done a lot of research internationally. We know there's two, it's a two-pronged kind of thing that increases. So a uh, thwarted sense of belongingness, so you don't feel you belong and, or, and you feel like a burden. And you know, so if we really engage young people in curriculum that's meaningful and relevant, so they're more engaged in what's happening, using their strengths and motivators, but also looking at building a sense of community, connection, and belonging. Let's get some feedback on that. What do you think of this idea? Yeah, I think the, it's great to have a wellness action plan, and I love that we're calling it preventative, mm -hmm. because the issues are um, long-standing, and we know 70% mm -hmm. of issues in child and uh, that happen in adolescence start in childhood mental health issues. And so if we don't start early and we don't work in schools and in, in, in doctor's offices and in the communities that children frequent with their families, we're gonna see long-term impacts. Mm -hmm. So building that wellness plan is crucial, but you know what? So is the stability of the support to do that. Mm -hmm. And so while children and adolescents can do that work, well, they also need a trained professional to work in a setting that can help them with that. In the school, outside of the school, at home, working with their families, addressing issues like racism and bullying that have been on the rise, like violence. These are important things that are impacting kids and their decision-making, their self-esteem each and every day. Mm -hmm. A mental wellness action plan for each student? What do you think? It just needs to be built into the entire educational system. It shouldn't feel like such a standalone thing. I think that is where maybe the stigma comes in. Um, we should be teaching kids that from right all the way from daycare all the way through. That should just be part of what we do. And that's why my sort of my I agree with you in that I again I come from a, a long line of teachers, a lot of friends that are teachers, and they're overburdened. They're 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 told to do everything. I know I gotta socialize your kid, I gotta teach your kid, I got <laughs> I get that they're overburdened, but we need to decide as a society what is going to be the most important thing and where are we going to put our resources. Okay. Do we need to get that first report card out in November or can we spend September getting to know one another?
we can decide to do it differently. We need educational reform. We need to put the soft um, uh, emotional learning piece has to be a priority. I mean, and if, if we don't, I mean, we're seeing what happens when we don't. Who cares if you have somebody who's got a PhD in engineering who's suicidal? Like, we, it, it, this yeah. is, it, we just we have to put it as a priority. And that was the benefit of COVID that it uprooted everything we knew about education and the school building and this is the you know status quo we were capable of really being innovative and being very needs focused how do we engage students how do we you know what do we do in terms of virtual learning and and to really um, you know, I mean, it, there were a lot of benefits for, uh, you know, from the experience of COVID going through it, and that schooling models can change, and that we can direct our, the way that we do education to the needs of students. Can I circle back to something with you, though, Nathan? And that is, we talked about students who are not engaged because they're not particularly interested in what's going on in the classroom. Do you think a change in curriculum would help address that issue? I think the any changes of curriculum, a teacher, a good teacher is going to put in place what they need to put in place. But it's how you put in place it. It's, it's how you connect that curriculum to the student. Mm -hmm. Often what we do in learning, it's not, it's, it's important what you learn, but teaching children how to learn is, is the ultimate goal. For sure. Right? And, and so curriculums come and go. What the, what the core of the piece is that we're providing them, but if we can meet the needs of the student and sometimes that is adapting to the curriculum to what they're interested in or how they see themselves relevant in the future um, right now when needs are not being met it's, it's it's like a fight or flight and we're talking about the flight today um, but you know there's another conversation on the table where uh, it, there's a fight and when needs are not being met and, and we see both of those coming out today in the classroom needs are not being met some of it's avoidance, some of it's mental health, some of it's violence in the classroom. It, it, it does exist and, and we just needed to do a better job. Okay, we're less than five minutes to go here and I know Stephen Lecce, the education minister, is watching because he watches this program every night. I know that. Even when we don't do education, I know he watches all the time. Anyway, we got four smart people here to give him some advice. Fire away. What does he need to do? Start with putting a school social worker in every single school across the province, working with the team, working with your education professionals so they can help identify these issues early and also connect people back in the community. We don't want kids pulled out of class for therapy sessions and counseling sessions. We want them connected to the right resources, right time, and managing and regulating their emotions early on. Okay, you said we have 4,800 schools. We have social workers in 1,000 schools. Less than a thousand school social workers out there. So we, we want, need... we want 4,800 schools with at least one social worker in a school. Imagine what that feels like to be able to know the social worker in your school, to be able to walk down the hall, say hello, know that you have a place that you can talk and you can get connected. Okay, hang on. Should I do the math here? How much do you have to pay to get a social worker? Well, I'll tell you this: the, the recent budget is uh, over 30 billion announced around uh, mental health in schools, in particular. Certainly, that's a small dent to put one social worker into schools. I'm going to say it's seventy-five thousand dollars to put a social worker in a school. Does that sound right? Sure. Seventy-five thousand dollars times. If there's a thousand in, then we need thirty-eight hundred more. Okay, that's two hundred eighty-five million dollars for mm. social workers alone. Now, Can don't, we do that? don't forget, some schools are only a couple hundred students. So certainly you can think about geography. Northern schools, the, the needs are different. You know, so we need, we need to think about geography. But what we know is at least one access to school social worker based on the geography and based on the number of students per school is crucial because that's where it starts. The conversations, you were talking about engagement and talking about school stressors because it's, absenteeism is just a sign that something more is going on. Stressors. Talk to Stephen Lecce. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about this, fame, this great poster that we used to have that said something like, wouldn't it be a great day when every school was fully funded and the Navy had to hold a bake sale to get a new, um, you know... Uh, Fighter jet or whatever. Yeah, right? <laughs> we have the money. We have the money. We need, we need to put the money where the money is needed. So Stephen Lecce, put some budget behind this so that we can get teachers trained, so that we can slow things down to get these kids back re-engaged. We can deliver that curriculum eventually. I believe ABC, acceptance, belonging, and then the delivery of curriculum. And if we don't get these school communities re-engaged as safe, 
havens for kids to want to go and be with friends and to be seen, then they will start to flourish. So we need to slow it down and fund those teachers and slow down education. Double the salaries of teachers. How's that? That's always Is that good. good? Put that in your calculator. I don't think Let's that, respect teachers and Nathan's what gonna, they do. Not gonna I think, I think that's a tough ask. Nathan, <laughs> yes, I was going to say. How long have you been asking for that? Yes. That's, uh, aside from doubling teacher salaries, yeah. what else would you want to recommend? Um, let's just work together to meet the needs of students and 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 be thoughtful in uh, asking the right questions. If we're talking about student absences. There's there's a there's a there's a solution to that, but we need to know why people are away. Uh, whether it is uh, those those anxieties of school, the uh, curriculum not uh, connecting with them, the panel should be for students here that are not attending school. Hmm. That's a great follow-up idea. I like that. Cheryl, last word to you. Um, I think we need to value young people, we need to value education, and we need to value families with action. Um, I think all schools need to have a photocopyable guidebook on supporting mm -hmm. students with school phobia so they've got the resources and the coordinated comprehensive um, supports and action to do it. Um, I think they need to take, all schools need to have a school phobia workshop um, or attend a training course that I'm starting on Saturday for professionals. I think uh, we need national leadership. Um, I think families need direct funding to support, uh, like, um, you know, for other families uh, with children who have disabilities so that they know what their children need um, to access and manage an education. That's Cheryl Boswell from Youth Mental Health Canada along with D.P. Sir from the Ontario Association of Social Workers, and on the other side of the table, Nathan Kaur from the Ontario Teachers Federation, Alison Schaefer, the family counselor. It's great to have all four of you here at TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you. Steve. Thank you. Humans like to put themselves at the center of history as the agents of change or perseverance or triumph. All well and good until you consider the animating thesis of Jonathan Kennedy's new book. It's called Pathogenesis, A History of the World in Eight Plagues. As the title suggests, Kennedy argues that germs, in fact, propelled some of the most significant shifts in human affairs. Jonathan Kennedy teaches politics and global health at Queen Mary University of London, and he's with us now on the line from London, UK, for more. Jonathan, it's good to have you on the air here. How are you? It's great to be here. I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. Let's start with a quote from the book. You write, the modern world has been shaped by microbes as much as by women and men. Now, that is going to come as news to anybody who's read some history. So help us out here. How so? Well, I think we have to start off with the way that we view the world. And I think our mindset is still very much stuck in the age of the Old Testament. So if we go back to the book of Genesis, uh, God supposedly created humans in his own image and gave us dominion over the natural world. So we still very much see this natural world as a stage on which humans, whether that's great men and women or classes, play out our roles. But actually, the more the more we know about the natural world, the more we realize that we're, we're it's not a stage, we're actually, you know, it's a system, it's an ecosystem. And if we want to live in that ecosystem successfully, then humans' role is actually pretty pretty insubstantial. And there's there's actually many ways of, of kind of measuring the impact of of microbes. And we can start off just with a few a few facts about the numbers of microbes there are. So for example, if we if we tried to weigh all the bacteria that lived on the planet, they would weigh over a thousand times more than all the humans living on the planet. There was and another factoid, I'm, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, there's another factoid I think I remember from your book, which is to say that if we considered the natural world in its entirety, human, as a calendar year, for example, humans show up at, on December 31st. That's how not yeah. part of the story we have been for the longest time. Yeah, and just before midnight at, at that, um, maybe half an hour before midnight. So if we think um, bacteria have been around for something like three, three and a half billion years, and humans of any type have been around for a couple of million, Homo sapiens, 200,000, maybe a bit more than that. So, you know, it's an astonishing difference in time. And, you know, humans have had to, had to evolve to 
live in a world that is dominated and in many ways still dominated by microbes. So just to give you another, another, another example, another factoid, um, there's something like 40 trillion bacteria living in and on our bodies. So our microbe consists of, of more bacteria than there are human cells in the, in the body. And, you know, we increasingly understand the role that they play in things like, um, digestion. And that's very much a, a hot topic in, 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 in popular science. But I think what we're beginning to understand is that they play other really important roles in our body and our, even our minds. So a particularly interesting piece of, of, of research recently looked at the DNA of bacteria in our feces. And it found that something like 90% of all the bacteria in our feces are capable of producing neurotransmitters, so chemical messengers um, um, that, that, that are able to influence our, our mood, things like serotonin and, and dopamine. And this is, this is just absolutely mind-blowing. Um, and it also opens up some interesting questions for, for medical science, because perhaps in the future it would um, um, perhaps in the future we can really use use the power of microbes to deal with some major major health issues. So even even dealing with depression. So the same study found that people who had clinical depression were lacking in a couple of types of bacteria. And so perhaps in the future, the best way to treat clinical depression will be to um, put these bacteria into our guts rather than to treat it with something like um, therapy or, or Prozac, for example. Hmm. Well, let's go back and take a look at some various important stops through history. And our first stop is going to be the Paleolithic era. So once upon a time, Homo sapiens shared the planet with Homo Neanderthals. And Homo sapiens won the contest with the Neanderthals. And you're going to tell us why. Well, I mean, I think the first thing to remember is the, the dominant explanation for, for why. And, you know, most textbooks tell us that humans won out because we were we were smarter, we were more intelligent. This is even implicit in the name that we give ourselves, Homo sapiens, so wise wise humans. Um, and actually, one of the one of the nice little snippets that I, I found out when I was researching this book was in the 19th century, there were some scientists that seriously proposed that Neanderthals should be referred to as homo stupidus. So that really kind of um, <laughs> underlines this, this, this kind of wise, stupid dichotomy through which we see um, we see ourselves and, and Neanderthals. Um, but actually, when we look at the evidence that's been gathered over the last 10 years, we see that Neanderthals really aren't that much different to um, our own species, to homo sapiens. Um, we now know that they buried their dead, possibly even that they lay flowers on the graves of the dead. We know that they looked after their sick. We know that they used various um, medicinal herbs to treat maladies. We know that they talked to one another. There's even evidence that they were able to sail um, or travel by boat between islands in the Eastern, Eastern Mediterranean. They painted caves. So this builds up this image of, of Neanderthals as you know, not that different to, to us. So that raises the question, why did they disappear 50 Fifty thousand years ago, um, whereas we we survived, and I think the most most powerful explanation is that Homo sapiens, who had evolved in um, tropical Africa, carried more and more deadly infectious diseases as we migrated out of out of the African con continent. And so, when we came into contact with Neanderthals, um, they got very sick and, and died out. Um, and so, so yeah, even from the, the very beginning of human prehistory, really, you see the important role of infectious diseases. So it wasn't so much our brains, we just had better immune systems. Yeah, or even we, 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 we carried more diseases and we, were, we had evolved um, to, to be resistant to those diseases. We'd, we'd evolved over, hun over you know, 100,000 years or so. All right, let's go to the next era we want to focus on, and that's the Neolithic era and the advent of farming. And here's what you write about that. It is remarkable to think that the impact of the migration of a small number of shepherds 
out of the Western Eurasian steppe 5,000 years ago, which was most likely made possible by a devastating plague pandemic, can literally still be seen and heard today across the world. Okay, what do you mean by that? Still seen and heard today across the world. Well, if we go back to about 5,000 years ago, which is when Stonehenge was first built, um, the population of the British Isles and most, most of Western Europe were um, a group of olive-skinned, dark-eyed people who had migrated across Europe and brought farming, farming with them. And all of a sudden, um, about 4,500 years ago, these people disappear from, from Great Britain or from the British Isles, and they're replaced by a new group of people who are taller, um, they often have blue eyes, and they have fairer features, and they originated from um, the far east of Europe on the on the steppe, these vast grasslands where they'd been um, shepherding shepherding animals. And you know, again, this has been a, a really a really kind of difficult mystery to solve. Why did this happen? Why did a why did a well-established farming farming community um, seemingly disappear? And um, there's an increasing amount of evidence that suggests that this was a plague pandemic. So um, this evidence comes from ancient DNA. So over the last 10 years, scientists have really, really improved their techniques for extracting and um, analyzing DNA from really, really, really old bones. But when they extract the DNA, they don't just get human genetic material. They also get the material of the microbes that were in our blood, in, in, in the blood at the time of death. And so by looking at this DNA, this microbial DNA, you can get a pretty good idea of what people were were dying of um, 5,000 or so, so years ago. And there's been a number of finds over the last few years of plague, um, you know, basically across Europe from, um, from, from, from England um, all the way, you know, in Sweden, in Germany, in Latvia, all the way to the far to the Far East. So this builds this picture of a, a devastating plague pandemic um, that cleared the way for these, these um, shepherds about kind of four and a half, four thousand years ago. And remarkably, these these shepherds that, 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 that they basically brought um, their genetic material, but they also seem to be the source of um, Indo-European languages. Um, so the languages that are spoken by people in, well, I guess, Canada, um, for, 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 for one, but also in, in much of Europe, um, in Central Asia, and even in, in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent. So it's really remarkable, I think, that we can still literally see and hear the consequences of this, this pandemic that occurred four and a half, five thousand 5,000 years ago. Let's bring you a little more closer to our time. Well, we're still going to be 2,000 years ago, the Roman <laughs> Empire. How did infectious diseases weaken the Roman Empire? Yeah, well, I think an important point from the book is that, you know, kind of what we might see as development often creates kind of new conditions in which infectious diseases can, can prosper. So in the first couple of centuries of the um, first millennium, Rome was a really remarkable polity. You know, it kind of um, it Rome ruled a, a vast area all the way from Scotland in the in the northwest to the Arabian Peninsula. Um, it was incredibly prosperous. Um, Rome was a city of a million people. Um, so basically, the the next city to be this big was London in the nineteenth century, and that just gives you an idea of how remarkable Rome Rome was. Um, but this kind of level of urbanization and the incredible amount, the, the incredible extent of interconnectedness um, in the Roman Empire created the perfect conditions for infectious diseases to spread. And so you have a couple of devastating plagues in the second and third centuries, the um, Antonine Plague and the Plague of Cyprian, which really kind of devastate the Roman, the Roman Empire. And you can you can see this, for example, in um, ice cores that have been drilled in Greenland recently, that there's a, a drop in um, lead pollution around the time of these pandemics, which seem to show that the economy just 
basically kind of um, stopped, um, came to a came to a sudden sudden halt because the majority of lead pollution would have come from processing silver, which was used for for the the the, the, the currency. So, yeah, again, infectious diseases played a really important role in the in the slow, steady decline of the Roman Empire. And how about in the rise of two of the world's most significant religions, Christianity and Islam? What role did they play there? Yeah, so there's a big, a big kind of, again, a big mystery with Christianity. Um, it didn't just become a, an empire-wide religion when Jesus was, was crucified. Um, for the first 200, 250 years after Jesus' death, um, it was a pretty small religion um, with maybe about 100,000 follow followers at the beginning of the of the third third century, so that was less than one percent of the whole Roman Roman population. And then all of a sudden, towards the end of the third century, you see this absolute explosion in the number of, of Christians. And um, you know why this why this was the case is a is you know kind of a really really important question. And I think a a convincing answer to to this is that Christianity. Um, basically provided a much more assuring guide to life and death life and death during pandemics than paganism paganism basically said that you know the here and now is all that there is and that pandemics are a result of the the god's anger we're not quite sure what often but the the anger of the gods and in particular apollo but christianity jesus's message um really emphasized the role of suffering in this life um and saw that as a key to gaining entrance to an everlasting paradise in the next. And also there was a big stress in Christianity on, on doing, doing good, good deeds. So there are, there are eyewitness accounts of, of basically the, the pagans abandoning their sick and running off to the countryside to try and survive the, the plague. But the Christians came and looked after them. And even basic nursing, like providing water and food meant that something like two thirds of those people who had been abandoned survived. And this created the best, the best commercial that any religion could have really, which is miracles or something that seemed to be a, a miracle. And also the same with, with, with Islam and it's, you know, what seems on the face of it to be miraculous growth in the hundred or so years after the death of the prophet Muhammad in 632. So um, within a century and a bit of, of, of Muhammad's death, you see Islam has spread out from the Arabian Peninsula um, and, and, and kind of Arabian Islamic armies control an empire that goes all the way from, from Spain and Morocco in the west to the borders of China in the, in the east. And we can only really understand this in the context of plagues that were devastating both the Roman, the late Roman, and the Persian empires at this at this time, and these were very urban, very well connected empires. Whereas the the people living in the Arabian Peninsula were largely protected from these these plagues because they were often nomadic, and if they weren't nomadic, it was still a very sparsely populated area. So, um, when, when when these two big empires, the the Romans and the and the Persians, were being weakened and weakened, this relatively increased the power of the Arab Muslim armies and when the time was right, they, they pushed out of the, the peninsula and spread really, really quickly. Let's talk about the Black Death in the medieval era. And you write that without the Black Death, we might still be in the Middle Ages. Okay, explain that if you would. Yeah, so I think the thing that you have to remember is that in the Middle Ages, in the feudal system, there was very little incentive for anybody to... Um, to, to innovate, particularly um, agricultural producers. The vast majority of the population were, were, were farmers, agricultural producers, because um, you know, if you were a feudal lord, um, it was a very unstable system. You were probably warring a bit with your with your neighbors. So there was a big incentive to play to, to basically spend any surplus resources on building defenses and developing your, your army. And if you didn't do this, if instead you focused on building windmills or on irrigation then it was likely that someone would come along and and conquer your your territory and even if you were a a, a serf a peasant um there wasn't much incentive to 
to produce lots of lots of stuff because it was likely that the Lord was just going to take it away from you. The um, in, incentive structure basically was such that you know it's best to be risk averse and to plant a variety of different crops on different parts of the the Lord's estate to make sure that um, you know if something was devastated by disease or extreme weather events or um, wild animals, then at least you'd have something else to live on for the for the year. Um, and it seems, so, so it would have seemed um, at the beginning of the 1300s that basically this this feudal system might kind of stay like that for forever. But then all of a sudden you have the Black Death, um, which comes from Central Asia and arrives in the middle of the 1300s and kills over half of the population in about five years. And, you know, that's devastating. But then you have secondary plagues and then you have other instances of plague coming back again and again and devastating the, the population. So the English population doesn't recover its pre-Black Death size until the 18th century. And this demographic shock basically um, creates a, a struggle between the serfs and the feudal lords. Um, and this plays out over 100 years, maybe even, even longer. But eventually, you get to the end of this, this struggle and the serfs have won, the, won their freedom. But basically, the, the lords end up renting out large plots of land to entrepreneurial peasants um, at market rates. And so these peasants um, basically become commercial farmers, and they have to invest in the latest technology and grow crops that are particularly suited to the area where they're growing them. And this leads to a, a boom in agricultural production that um, basically basically kickstarts capitalism and, um, you know, again, changes the world in ways that we're still very much feeling feeling today for better and for worse. So you can actually draw a direct connection between the Black Death and capitalism. Yeah, there's a there's a very clear kind of chain of events that, um, that, that, that link the two. Hmm. OK, let's. Um... You know, there's so much history in this book, and we haven't got time to cover it all in one <laughs> conversation, but I do want to get a better understanding of this. How did writing this book change you and how you thought about history differently? Well, I guess I was, like everyone else, um, you know, kind of I was brainwashed into thinking that, you know, kind of humans are, are the driving force of, of history. And so I think, you know, really kind of, spending a couple of years reading about infectious diseases and reading about their role on human history. I guess it makes you a bit more humble and it makes you realize that, you know, we really are living in a finely balanced world. And if we, if we're not careful, you know, uh, our species will, will really come into to some trouble. But I think, I think as well, you know, you just come to the realization that, Although we like to think that COVID was uh, an aberration, a kind of once in a century occurrence, when you look back at history, you realize this that this isn't the case. You know, there's nothing particularly unusual about the the coronavirus pandemic. Um, in fact, you know, there's periodic cases throughout history of, of 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 kind of these devastating pandemics coming along and you know really causing massive death and disruption. And so I think the the key thing is that we need to to realize that you know we have to prepare for the next pandemic in the best way way possible and that means on the one hand um you know kind of people with a, a medical background developing um their understanding of diseases and of cures and preventions to, the, to those diseases but also we need to really understand how our society creates habitats that allow infectious diseases to to flourish um you know, certainly in many ways, we're living now in a new golden age for for microbes. Um, the unprecedented size of the world's population, the encroachment on on animal habitats, um, industrial scale factory farming, and also the the ease with which we can travel across the world very very quickly. These combine to create you know the perfect conditions for pathogens to jump from from other species to, to humans and to spread around the world really, really quickly. So we have to be, be one, be prepared for this, but also try to try to kind of mitigate the, the chance of that happening.
Well, just in our last 30 seconds here, I mean, if there's one big takeaway from your book is that the next disaster is, uh, I mean, you can set your watch to it. It's never that far away. And I wonder whether you think we yet understand how the disaster we have just come through, COVID-19, is going to rewrite this next chapter of our history. Well, I think it's a fool's errand for people to try to predict the future, but um, certainly I think we can we can feel that COVID is having an impact sometimes for for the good if we think about work from home. And I'm not sure how things are in in Canada, but certainly in this country, sky high inflation res, inflation rates are really causing a lot of a lot of problem. And again, you can trace that back to the to the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. So I think we won't really know for years to come, but certainly the world after the pandemic is very different to the one one before it. And I think the, you know, to finish on an optimistic note, on, on an optimistic note, we we really have to ensure that the the change that COVID has brought about is is positive and um, work towards that. The name of the book is Pathogenesis, a history of the world in eight plagues. It has brought Jonathan Kennedy to our virtual studio from London, UK. It's a great pleasure to meet you and thanks for joining us tonight on TVO. Oh, it was really lovely. Thank you for, for, for the time. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch.